So the marriage contract, you can't quit it. You can't get out of it from the point of view of the founder. You could do so, you had a divorce, but divorce, very limited circumstance. The courts tended to be very hostile to divorce, only very clear circumstances. For example, adultery that could be demonstrated or abandonment for several years, that kind of significant problems with the marriage. The same thing you could say is it was true of in general, their whole orientation in, in, in life and in society. Join the best in the movement. It's conservative conversations with ISI, educating for liberty since 1953. Welcome back. You're listening to Conservative Conversations with Marlo Slayback and Tom Saruf. Today's guest is Thomas West, who holds the Paul Ermine Potter and Don Tibbetts Potter Endowed Professorship in Politics at Hillsdale College. His research areas include American political thought, natural law, natural right, Aquinas, Hobbes, Locke, and Leo Strauss. He's the author of many books, including The Political Theory of the American Founding, which he joins us to talk about today. Thanks so much for joining us, Dr. West. It's a pleasure. Thank you. Before we get to our interview, we'd like to thank you for listening to Conservative Conversations. This podcast is a production of the Intercollegiate Studies Institute, and our mission is to educate for liberty. If you'd like to help us in fulfilling the mission, please rate and review this podcast on Apple Podcasts to help us reach more listeners like yourself. So, Dr. West, your book, The Political Theory of the American Founding, it relies heavily on the natural law and natural rights approach, which I hope many of our listeners will be familiar with through elementary, middle school, high school education when they're learning about, you know, the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution, the American founding and their history of social studies classes, which was sort of the case for me. Your book is much more rigorous and high level than anything you learned there, but they ho hopefully will have a vague idea of what the sort of natural rights approach is. Um, but sort of there's within conservatism, at least there's a lot of different perspectives and arguments over the true meaning and understanding of the American founding. And I'm sort of thinking about, you know, from ISI's perspective, we read a lot of Russell Kirk. So he thinks about it as a more conservative reaction, but the sort of the first question getting into the book at the big picture level is why is it that you think that the natural law, natural rights approach is the true way for the sort of interpretive key for understanding the American founding and the American character? I think I could say that in contrast to many other scholars, uh, whether academics or public intellectuals, I thought that the best approach, most likely to reveal what the founders were really about, was to look at their own documents, their, and especially their main fundamental documents, such as not only the Declaration, but also uh, the state constitutions, and various formal official statements made by other elected bodies which were meeting and publishing uh, manifestos all the way through that whole revolutionary period. And, uh, you know, as opposed to, let's say, uh, conservative intellectuals like Patrick Deneen or Saurabh uh, Amar, uh, not Saurabh Amar, uh, sorry, uh, Patrick Deneen, uh, he tends to look to, you know, go back to Locke, go back to Hobbes, go back to all these European antecedents. My view of that is, uh, well, show me in the founding that people were that way, that they believed those ideas. And so rather than go through that process of first reading the founding, then Locke, why not start with the founding? And I learned, I just, uh, that just from going into it, they had a very coherent and, and, uh, wide ranging understanding of not just principles, but also policies that need to be implemented in order to protect our rights. And that's what government's for in their view. So for listeners, um, I actually met Dr. West during the Claremont Publius Fellowship in 2021. And um, I think it might be valuable for listeners, especially if they're not too familiar with your work to first um, Kind of get us up to speed, Dr. West, on the lens through which your that animates your work. So um, I know that perhaps, especially Claremont, is um, very much so considered kind of under the umbrella of the uh, West Coast Straussians, and um, Strauss and Jaffa were huge influences on on those interpretations of the founding. So would you be able to kind of um, give us a uh, crash course in what that means exactly and how that animates uh, your approach to um, to the founding and uh, the, a lot of the um, the philosophical influence there. 
Well, okay, it's true. Yes, I am a student of Harry Jaffa. And what I learned from Jaffa, among other things, is that the idea of equality, as the founders understood it, is indeed central to what they wanted to achieve, uh, what they were trying to do. Um, sure. Uh, and But what does that mean? A equality is a term, of course, that everybody today throws around like, well, I believe in equality. Everybody believes in it. So, and also the term liberalism. People today say, well, I'm, you know, liberalism is modern as, as Joe Biden and uh, Joe, you know, as Hillary Clinton, Franklin Roosevelt, it's Thomas Jefferson. I mean, I, to me, that just confuses the question. And so I prefer to use the term, uh, I don't I prefer not to use the term liberalism, but simply what did the founders think uh, in terms of their idea of what natural rights and natural law tell us about basic human ideas and obligations and what government should do or be like in order to live up to and achieve those goals. Jaffa was famous for his uh, writings on slavery, you know, and how, how Lincoln revived the concepts of the founders on, on equality to make the argument against slavery expansion. All that's fine. On the other hand, Jaffa um, was a kind of a New Deal liberal. Uh, he very much believed in the U.S as the dominant world power uh, to remake the whole world in its image. Uh, I completely reject those ideas because I'm much closer to the founders' actual views on that than Jaffa was. So, you know, this whole West Coast, East Coast thing, it can be, it's, it's not that clarifying, I guess I would say. I think it's important to just try to understand the founders on their own terms and then what happened later in contrast to really bring out what's distinctive about them. One of the other things that I found interesting in your work, as opposed to some other conservative uh, scholars, is that you believe that there is something unifying enough to call it, quote unquote, a founding, as opposed to some people say, mm -hmm. you know, a, the Constitution's a compromise document, so it has no, has no uh, logical and coherent, consistent, you know, philosophy or view. So I'm wondering if you could say some more about that and why you think there is something that we could call a founding and how you approach that in the book as well. There's a founding in the sense that uh, that, that, that there was an overall consensus about what government is for and pretty much, broadly speaking, how government should be constructed. I once was asked by a historian, are you a uh, lumper or a splitter? By which he meant, do you look at the big picture or do you look at all the details that put together? And I said, oh, I'm a lumper. Because now, today, what we care about in terms of the founding or what I care about, what anyone should care about as a citizen is, what was their legacy? What did they try to do? Did they achieve it? Was it a good thing? And what's their legacy? Uh, you have to be a lumper for that. It, you can't get lost in intricacies of debates in the 1790s over the French treaties or the bank. Um, you can't uh, be overly concerned with the federalism question. Uh, the anti-federalists and federalists all agree government's there to secure your rights. It should be done on the basis of consent and elections. So let's figure out what the best structure is to that end. That's what, so the big, the, the agreement was universal. The disagreements were over then particular implementations. So to rewind a little bit um, to the topic of equality, uh, you dedicate a chapter in your book to that topic of liberty and equality. And these these two subjects are often conflated um, and they're often considered uh, mutually exclusive. So what is the confusion there, do you think? And do you think, and when thinking about natural law as a rubric for harmonizing these principles um, and obligations in a system, systematic reasonable way, how do those two, liberty and equality, come together? Right. For the founders, uh, liberty and equality are two sides of the same coin. And I mean it this way. Uh, all men are created equal to them meant all men are, by nature, equally free and independent. I'm paraphrasing. There, it's a quote from the, I think, Virginia Declaration of Rights. All men by nature equally free and independent. It's in that sense we're equal, meaning equally free, meaning independent, meaning no one rules us without our consent. That's freedom. That's liberty. That's equality. Government is there 
to take that natural right we have under the law of nature and to protect it because outside of government rights are endangered we fa- we don't under you know we don't uh, we are uh, vulnerable to the depredations of others on our person and property uh, government institutes criminal law civil law enables and punishes people Government creates an army in order to repel possible attacks from elsewhere. Uh, that's the basic. That's the, that's the basic uh, overall picture uh, of, how, of how natural law informs uh, government. And I was thinking, there's a there's a uh, you know a historian uh, Joseph Ellis, who's not a not a big fan of my writing, wrote a very negative review of one of my earlier books, vindicating the founders. And so I take him as kind of representative of the mainstream history, history profession. And what he says is, it's a mystery what Jefferson meant by equality, because equality and liberty can never come together, and never, there can never be perfect equality and perfect liberty. Uh, people who say things like that, like Ellis, they don't really know what the founders meant by this, which is kind of amazing because he's, an, you know, he's supposedly an expert on Jefferson and all the rest. So. To me, this is very simple. These are very simple points about how how the how to understand these this relationship. So you you know you think about somebody like Tocqueville who said there's a conflict between liberty and equality, but he didn't say equality the principle of it. He he said liberty and equality of condition. So yes, if you take equality to mean what people today often mean equity, equality of condition, sure there's a conflict. Because in order to get everybody the same income, you're going to have to take some people's property and hand it to other people. Uh, that's not that's that's our use. That's the way people today, liberals today, often use the term. The people in the founding didn't think of it that way at all. That for, to them, that was equal, equal and equal rights. Equal rights meaning fundamentally the right to liberty, and of course, right to life, right to worship, right to pursue happiness, right to bear arms, all the rest. <clears throat> On a similar, similarly related note with liberty and equality, how do liberty and equality fit together with the idea of authority uh, on, the, on the natural rights theory of the founding? Sorry, uh, how, do, how do what? I'm sorry. Uh, could you repeat the uh, question? Does, sure, liberty and authority, because re- if liberty and equality. Well, liberty and authority, together, yeah, excellent. Okay, yeah. I understand now, yes. Yeah, of course, liberty means you get left alone. Authority means you get told what to do. So, of course, the two in, in that kind of formal way are, are opposed. But what the founders thought uh, in common with, you know, many other, many European thinkers, you know, and lots of people ever since, but they thought, well, yeah, of course, uh, liberty in the sense of just doing what you want is 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 incompatible, not only with, it, with government, but also incompatible with any kind of uh, uh, decency outside of government. So the founders used the term law of nature, laws of nature, to indicate that even when you're not in, within, not in government, you're subject to authority in the sense of not human authority, but the authority of the laws of nature and of nature's God, to use Jefferson's phrase. Uh, why is that not sufficient? Why can't we just live equally outside of government? The, of course, the answer is because, as Hamilton says in The Federalist, men are ambitious, vindictive, and rapacious. That people are bad, people are, are ready to harm others. Uh, you know, wicked and dissolute men, as Jefferson says in his uh, bill on the, on the criminal laws of Virginia, he says wicked and dissolute men commit crimes against the property and person of others, that that's why we have criminal law to punish them and to and to deter them from such acti- from such uh, immoral activities. So authority exists. It does mean we are curtailed to some degree in our liberty, but we make that, uh, we, we alienate a portion of our liberty, to use the term the founders would have used, to uh, government in order to better protect all the rest of our liberty that we uh, ideally would enjoy uh, in a natural state if all men were pure, purely rational and uh, willing to live together in peace and harmony. So, sorry if you're watching this and my camera is super blurry right now, but um, to 
kind of go into more detail about the um, na uh, about nature and natural law. A major dispute among conservatives today is the over this entire idea of the state of nature and whether natural law account of the founding or any account for that matter are dependent on contractualism um, is worth conserving. So in your book, you give a positive right. account of the state of nature as something that's necessary and that's central to the thought of the founding. So perhaps you can kind of go into more detail about that tension. Between, uh, sorry, between sorry, the, between like among conservatives today and, and the kind of how they're approaching Approach that there's a, so what the conservatives today, as I understand it, people like Kazoni, but the their concern is uh, a merely contractual orientation is insufficient for for the for a, any kind of decent stable society. Uh, and the um, what the founders would say about that is, well, it, it uh, what kind of what are we talking about exactly when we say merely contractual? Because what they said in their writings and what they instituted in their laws were, was uh, something that, that was was that contracts need to be made with a view to what is required by the law of nature. So, in other words, there's a moral guide to how we contra how we form contracts or covenants, as they sometimes called them. There's a moral guide to that, what, the, what determines a legitimate and a not legitimate contract. The area of family law, which I spend uh, a whole chapter on in my Political Theory of the American Founding book, is about all the ways in which the founders thought, uh, implemented limits on sex and uh, activities within marriage, parental and child, 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 parent-child relations, all, all, kinds of, all kinds of legal rules that guided all of that, that were not merely consensual. They were rules that were, they thought, were determined by or dictated by the laws of nature themselves. I mean, in other words, going back to what is it that nature tells us about us, ourselves as human beings, people in the founding believed that one of the things we learn from thinking about our nature is we need children for the future, future citizens, the future of ourselves, right? Self-perpetuation. And children need help from adults, which means you cannot leave it merely to the consensual arrangements of adults as to how you deal with children. That's why marriage law, you might say, was the big exception to their general rule that adult human beings should be able to just get along together by deciding contracts among themselves purely on the basis of their own will. So, for, so the marriage contract, for example, you can't quit it. You can't get out of it from the point of view of the founders. You could do so. You have divorce, but divorce, very limited circumstances. Uh, the courts tended to be very hostile to divorce. And so, you know, only very clear circumstances, for example, adultery that could be demonstrated. Uh, so, or abandonment for several years, that kind of, I mean, significant, uh, uh, you know, problems with the marriage. So, uh, the same thing you could say is it was true of in general their their whole orientation in 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 in, in life in society. So this idea that people like Patrick Deneen have been uh, unfortunately uh, teaching to young conservatives, namely that the founders believed anything at all is okay as long as it's consented to among adults. That, that's completely uh, wrong from the point of view of the founders. And I would say, in a very, in a word, why does he make that mistake, he, uh, Patrick Deneen? I, mean, I would say he does so because he doesn't give enough credit to their natural law orientation, and he speaks mostly of natural rights. I think that's a great segue to the second part of the book, which is, I'd say, if I were to sum it up, uh, not to sum it up for you, because you obviously know you wrote it, but uh, for the listener, it focuses on, I guess, the moral character and habits that are Required of the populace in order to have self-government. Um, and so you talked about that in terms of marriage law and the marriage covenant, but what's not immediately obvious, or at least like when I was being educated in uh, middle and high school about the American founding, there's sort of like a libertarian reading that is maybe right. a, a, under, in your view, is a caricature of what the true meaning of the founding is, but it's not immediately obvious just reading the text that uh, the Constitution or the Declaration of Independence 
is sort of a virtue forming or that there's a, a role for government in the formation of virtue. Um, but I'm wondering if you could sort of help us tease apart some of these things and some of the habits that you had in mind or that the founders had in mind that were necessary for self-government. Yeah, that's really important. Uh, the point you made about the Declaration and Constitution, you're not going to find in those documents anything about what I just talked about in regard to marriage, and you won't find anything about education, almost very little uh, about uh, how government should con how, uh, should try to sustain the moral character of society, what, you know, how government should support the uh, Christian uh, Protestant Christian character of America, all of which were taken up at the state level, and that's why you don't find them in the federal documents. The Declaration and Constitution are about the federal government. They're about declaring independence, and they're about how the federal government should be constituted. If you look at the powers of Congress that are granted in the Constitution, Article 1, Section 8, there's nothing in there about what I just talked about. It's all about things like Get, how do we manage commerce among the states so that they can get along? How do we make sure there's going to be a national free market economy? How do we uh, prevent the states from issuing inflationary currency? Well, put them on the gold standard. Uh, you know, how do we make sure that states acknowledge minimal rules of property rights? Well, tell them they can't abrogate contracts through state law. These are the kinds of things you know, that, that the federal government rightly is concerned with, but, they, but the federal government, by its very nature, back then, was unconcerned with domestic policy. And when you think about what is government, how does government make our rights secure, mostly doesn't have anything to do with the federal government except foreign policy. Of course, we don't want to be attacked. And so the feds are, and they're the ones who have exclusive control over that. But what about everything else? What about education, uh, sustaining character, marriage, care, care of children? Everything else is state. So you have to go beyond that. And so one of my great complaints against uh, political scientists, I'll, I'll blame our own profession, my own profession, is we don't spend enough time on the states. We need to, we need to introduce students to the idea that government at both levels was uh, governments at both levels were complementary to each other. They were meant to finish, fill, to, to complete what the other can't do adequately. So local government for the things that are local, like management of education, character, e economic, you know, rules of property, rules of exchange, markets, uh, tort law, you know, regulation of uh, use of property. All of that was conducted at the state level. So that's why in the second half of my book, uh, where I get into moral, you know, gut regulations and legislation having to do with morality, and then in the rest of the third part of the book, I talk about all the detailed regulations they set up concerning economics, which again, it's like people today go, oh, well, the founders believed in free market economics. As, as if all you have to do is simply say, okay, everybody, there's a free market. It turns out there are all kinds of laws, both civil and, cri and criminal laws, that have to be instituted and, uh, you know, to define tort in a way that doesn't constrain the use of property, right? What if, you know, in, Eng in England, you know, you can sue somebody if you're building it, it put cast shade on your own building. Sometimes here too, but the founders thought you got to be very careful with tort law. You can't be using tort law to basically you institute the NIMBY principle, not in my backyard idea. You, their idea was the natural law requires that government protect everyone's right to acquire property as best possible, which means proper constraint on both regulation and the idea of personal injury. Same with the family law. The idea was how do we create a, an institution to raise ch where children can be adequately cared for, adequately raised with minimal government interference, but with the necessary government interference when it comes to defining marriage and making sure it remains uh, as a lifelong commitment under most circumstances. Um, on the subject of economic policy and especially <clears throat> domestic economic policy, um, and I think this has been especially 
salient and kind of punctuated among conservatives in, in the last few years, but he dedicated a chapter to reconsidering the famous disputes between Hamilton and Jefferson with respect to right. uh, economic policy and um, their vision for, for you know, the, the young country. And you say that the traditional reading of this dispute is often misunderstood. So what do you think is missing from the consensus, consensus narrative of that dispute and how does it fit into the overall context of uh, the founding and you know this, this early period? Yeah, I think the Hamilton-Jefferson dispute, which everyone knows about uh, from, from high school history, um, as, I, as I mentioned earlier, uh, it depends whether you look at it from the point of view of the lumpers or the splitters. The splitters emphasize the differences and it's true, uh, Jefferson's, uh, Jefferson and Madison thought we should not have a national bank. Uh, Madison thought, we, uh, J Hamilton and Washington thought we should. Uh, Jefferson uh, did, was not in favor of subsidies of manufacturers uh, and uh, Hamilton thought we should have subsidies to make sure we develop our domestic manufacturing. Uh, all that's true, but then it turns out when you look into it, uh, well, when Jefferson became president and then later Madison, they both decided actually the bank wasn't that bad an idea. So all that kind of heated rhetoric of the 1790s turned out to be a bit exaggerated. They were, uh, they were the partisan feelings of the day tended to, tended to overshadow the closeness of the two parties. And the same thing you could say was true, I would say it was true all of the of of, uh, of 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 the of France, you know the, the whole question: Should we maintain our treaties with France? You know, should we favor France or England in the 1790s? Actually, the real position that mo that that both <laughs> Hamilton that Hamilton and Jefferson ended up supporting was neutrality. Uh, sometimes people forget the fact that in the when Washington met with his cabinet over the neutrality proclamation, Hamilton and Jefferson both supported it. So, you know, over, you can overstate those differences. Uh, you know, Jefferson said, let's not, let's not formally abrogate our treaty with France, but let's delay actually involving ourselves in a war with England if the French ask us. Hamilton was more eager to just fa formally throw the treaty out. Both of them basically agreed, we need to stay out of that European war that is not in our interest, not good for the United States. So uh, that's it. I mean, I think, uh, you know, it, the, you know, Jefferson was in favor of a nation of farmers. Ha Madison, Hamilton said, "No, let's have more. Let's have more manufacturers." Well, that was true for a while, and then Jefferson, after the War of eighteen twelve, said, "Yeah, I was wrong about that. Sorry, we need domestic manufacturers. We almost lost the war with uh, that war in eighteen twelve. So, I've learned my lesson. I very, you know, very sensible, and came around and saw. Yep, Hamilton is right on some things." And uh, on the other hand, Jefferson was also in a way right because he said, we don't need subsidies to manufacturers. Let's, let's let the markets handle it. Madison agreed with him. And that's actually what happened. The subsidy plan of Hamilton was defeated in Congress. Most of the development of the early American economy took place locally by individual investors. And it, was, it worked. It actually created the republic, uh, the manufacturing republic, over time that Hamilton wanted to create through subsidies, but which in fact we created through Jeffersonian means, namely markets, free markets with minimal government interference. That shows you, I'm just giving you these examples because it's so complicated. When you start realizing how much they agreed on, and how much, how much they, positions changed over time, but what they came around on was this consensus, right? Government really does need to be staying out of European wars. That became this, the policy of the whole 19th century up to, up to uh, you know, until World War One, And it was, that was the consensus. Uh, in, in spite of those apparent big, uh, you know, partisan differences at the time. One of the other main consensus points that you, uh, give a nod to in the book is about the important or the consensus around sound, reliable money. Uh, and I, I asked the question because that's, I think, so prescient uh, for our own times today. But if you yeah. could speak to why and what the founders had in mind with the idea of sound money and why you think it 
uh, or what it what it means for us today, given our uh, current inflation troubles. Yeah, well, I can say something about what they wanted. Uh, it's harder to say what should we should do now uh, for many reasons. But what they wanted was to stop what had been uh, a kind of uh, a uh, wild inflationary printing of money in the 1770s and 80s. You know, to finance the war, Revolutionary War, Congress itself began the you know began to just print dollars. Uh, you know, and after a while, it became clear you could never, you'll never be able to trade in them for actual gold. So people just stopped taking them, and so they, you know, they became more and more worthless. Uh, and and so in this, when Cong when the Constitutional Convention met, one of the things they agreed on was we need to make sure that the states can't do that, right? So they outlawed the states from making anything except gold and silver. Uh, pay, a, a payment for debts, and then they also did not give Congress the authority to issue bills of credit, which is what dollar bills were called back then, you know, paper money, uh, although they did authorize Congress to make loans, you know, to uh, or to borrow money, you know, which in a way created something like bills of credit, because, you know, like the, 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 you borrow, you know, you if you lent some money to the federal government, you'd get a piece of paper that said government is going to pay you X amount of dollars at some point. So, you know, you had something like paper money, but it was always backed up with the idea that you go to the bank. So in the first bank of the U.S., it had it was gold standard, you know, or gold or silver. I right? said so they pick, you know, but they had to pay if you brought in one of their paper dollar bills uh, or paper uh, bills, you know, the paper uh, uh, uh Bills of, bills of credit, they had to pay. And, and uh, we also, you know, we also had many state banks at that time. Some of, and of course, sometimes they would issue more paper money than they had gold to back it up. They'd go bankrupt. Uh, and sometimes there would be, well, for example, there was a coalition of banks in Massachusetts that developed in the 18, I believe, 1830s and 40s where the banks would kind of audit each other and make sure they had enough gold to back up the papers and guarantee each other's currency. So you could have a stable currency based on free market uh, banking uh, at that time, and, and that's what they did. Uh, the, the big change uh, took place basically after the Federal Reserve came in. That's what transformed the American monetary system. It really gave the federal government, or the Federal Reserve, which is not even federal government exactly, this you know, coalition of big banks, uh, an opportunity to manipulate the currency to their own advantage, which led to the end of the gold standard for regular consumers in 1933, so a few years later. And then the Great Depression, many, many would argue the Great Depression itself was created by the Federal Reserve's mismanagement of the currency. And, you know, whereas, which, whereas in previous American recessions, they had been relatively small because limited to individual banks going bankrupt and others taking up the slack eventually. I don't know what we do today. I don't know. There are some there are some people who argue you you could go back to the gold standard. There are some people who wonder whether uh, China and Russia right now are developing an alter alternative currency system in which gold or some other commodity might be the backing. Of it, you know, kind of going back to the old idea that money ought to be able to be redeemable in something real and valuable. So who knows? But that it, it, what we have now, it's it's to me, it's just like scary. I, there's no basis of it. It's like people take dollars because they're because other people take dollars. At what point is that? Does that become a house of cards and everybody just says, actually, I can't. You know, I'm not going to take dollars anymore because I'd rather use this alternative currency that Russia and Japan are working on, or Russia, excuse me, Russia and China, rather. So I don't know. I don't know what's going to happen. It's uh, it's one of those features of modern government where I think a lot of people just say to each other, yeah, it's going to work fine because it's always worked. And the founders, I think if they looked at it right now, they'd go, I don't know what you people think you're doing, but that looks very unstable to us. So just to pivot since we are unfortunately running out of time. Um, and I think this this question is probably on a lot of people's minds, especially since um, 
with the <clears throat> emergence of kind of the, the post liberals and other, uh, you know, factions on the right that have um, maybe criticized our ability to continue governing along, uh, along the kind of guidelines that the founders set up just because of um, perhaps changing norms or, uh, you know, just morality and how these things have adapted for better or worse <laughs> over the last um, hundred plus years. But I, I, I'm wondering what exactly, what are the, what are we lacking in terms of virtues that the founders took to be a given requirement for self-government? What moral sentiments were um, maybe considered to be features that were ne necessary to keep up that, um, to keep up self-government that we are lacking today, or maybe they're considered just outright, uh, you know, they're, they're blasphemous <laughs> when we have um, a uh, liberal governing regime that is, you know, I mean, conservatives, I don't think I have to say this on this podcast, but are often considered pariahs in popular society. So how do we, how do we even navigate that when that's kind of the, the norm now? Well, okay, what virtues do we lack? Um, just start naming them. I mean, it's, you know, is there, it, the founders counted very much on uh, the virtue of vigilance, that is, suspicion of government, uh, constant questioning of government. Are you doing what you're supposed to do, or, or are you doing something that's going to oppress us? Uh, today, if you have that mentality, they don't call it a virtue. They call you a conspiracy theorist and put you on an FBI list. Uh, another virtue that's lacking is, is uh, of course, patriotism. You ask high school kids today, you know, what, what does American citizenship mean to you? And they'll go, I don't know. Doesn't mean anything to me. You know, dual citizenship. We have, we have dual citizenship now since the 1960s. What does that even mean? The founding fathers would go, no, pick a country. Stick with it. That's what consent means. Uh, and, you know, and also like this, a conscientious, devotion to Republican government. That was the fun, you know, that was the main virtue. You had to believe in fair play. You had to believe that honesty is the best policy, as George Washington said. I mean, people today make fun of this stuff. Honesty is the best policy. Oh, yeah. No, it used to, I mean, the idea was if you have a society of high trust, where people are honest with each other, everything works better. Uh, if you have uh, if you have elections being conducted by a, by people a large group of which a large perhaps even majority of which think cheating is okay, you cannot have elections. You can't have Republican government. So to what extent do we even have Republican government in the U.S. now, given our four month election season, with ballots being approved that are you know that are obviously mismatched signatures with voting machines being shut down in Republican districts with mail-in mail -in voting boxes that are unsupervised by anyone and can be easily uh, tampered with. This is, we're, we're, we have a fake, we, kinda, we have a kind of fake, half fake, half real Republicanism at the moment. That too requires uh, vigilance and virtue to, to challenge. Can you have a jury trial in Washington, D.C. under the constitutional meaning of jury trial? I don't think so. You have the entire population there, like 97% of them voted against Trump. And so if somebody comes in and says, I'm a, you know, and he's told to be, that you're a Trump person, the jury is almost always going to go, yeah, you're not my kind of person. You can't have a Republican government if they don't have the virtue of believing that the rule of law is important, that justice matters, that uh, fair play, that equal liberty is something that I need to care about as an individual and not just that we officially pronounce it in our official, in our documents. Well, on that note, I think we're out of time. So we'd like to thank you for joining us today. Uh, and if people want to follow more of your work or keep up with what you're saying and what you're writing, where should they look? Well, I'd say, first of all, start with the uh, the Political Theory of the American Founding, my recent book, uh, that's what we've been talking about. And uh, I, uh, if you Google the words Thomas West Hillsdale College, you'll come up to, we'll get to my uh, faculty page where I have many of my articles are posted there, PDF versions of them. Uh, so that's all there. Videos can be found online. I mean, it's uh, 
it's a video course I just did for Hillsdale College uh, that you can find uh, online.hillsdale.edu. Uh, you know, a, a discussion of my book with uh, Professor David Azarad, uh, where we go into the, uh, you know, the question of what, you know, the controversies about what the founders believed and uh, maybe in contrast with our current, this current interview that we've, that we've just done, I, David Azarad and I spent a lot of time on co the comparisons between the contemporary and what the founders did. We, we did that to some extent too, and I appreciate that very much. I think that's what most viewers would be more interested in typically. So I appreciate, thank you very much. Uh, well, Tom you, and Marlo for, for this uh, interview. Thank you so much, Dr. Ross, for joining us. And um, thank you for listening to Conservative Conversations with ISI. And if you've enjoyed this podcast, please feel free to head over to isi.org slash resources to see all that we offer our members, including the Intercollegiate Review, Select Modern Age Articles, ISI Books, and of course, this podcast. Thanks again for listening. Don't forget to rate and review, and we'll see you next time on Conservative Conversations with ISI.